The Day After Tomorrow is an interesting title for a movie aimed at an audience with limited knowledge about weather and climate, not to mention the physics behind them. The title conjures up the idea that something bad's going to happen this week, maybe even the day after tomorrow. The movie was directed by Roland Emmerich and stars Dennis Quaid, Jake Gyllenhaal, Emmy Rossum, Celia Ward, and Ian Holm. It was released in the United States back in May of 2004. The Day After Tomorrow is an engrossing, climate-related, apocalyptic film, but is it geographically accurate? Today on The Vantage Point, we're going to take a shot at answering that question. I hope you'll join me. The film was made in the middle of the hottest decade on record. Of course, no one knew that factoid until around 2011 and 12 when the decade was in the rearview mirror. Shortly after the film's release, the use of the name global warming shifted to climate change. As far back as the 1990s and a bit earlier, people understood climate change as simply global warming. In some ways, this movie helped the popular culture and unfortunately some scientists shift gears from portraying global warming to the more encompassing concept of climate change. Also, thanks to this movie, many casual observers of climate came to believe that any kind of aberrant weather was caused by humanity and conveniently called for more governmental control and regulation of the economy. In a popular cultural context, the climatological shift or paradigm shift from global warming to climate change can be seen in other Hollywood movies like the flooded warm earth scenario and Kevin Costner's Waterworld. In either case, these post-apocalyptic worlds serve as fictionalized evidences of humanity's culpability in changing weather patterns. These movies conveniently bring to mind the emerging cataclysmic continuum that ranges from the excessive heat to killer cold. But one of the most interesting and arguably feasible movies to hit the screen was the 2009 movie Knowing, which starred Nicolas Cage and Rose Byrne. It showed the futility of human efforts in the face of a massive solar storm. In the day after tomorrow, humanity is awakened by a wide array of extremely volatile weather. As the movie explains, these odd events are set in motion by humanity's gluttony for fossil fuels. Greenhouse gases have messed up Mother Nature so bad that she's confused and has forgotten to follow basic physics. Yes, that's true. The movie shows devastating tornadoes wreaking havoc on Los Angeles. Siberia and the rest of the Northern Hemisphere are swallowed up by three Category 5 hurricanes. Tsunamis swamp New York City and almost drown Lady Liberty. Meanwhile, the film explains that the melting of polar ice caps and glaciers have created rivers of fresh water that are dangerously lowering the salinity of the world's four oceans. If these cataclysmic events seem reasonable to you, I invite you to stick around. Let's take geography to Hollywood and see what's up with the day after tomorrow. There's a reason why high altitude places like Breckenridge and Vail, Colorado normally experience more snowfall than lower altitude locations at similar latitudes. It's because air temperatures drop by 3.5 to 5 degrees per thousand feet. Here's a factoid that the movie casually dismisses. Descending air masses heat up at those rates too. This was a serious flaw in the day after tomorrow. The movie shows descending masses of frigid air destroying helicopters, freezing fuel lines, and shattering glass windows in Manhattan's skyscrapers. With negative 150 degrees Celsius, that's 238 degrees Fahrenheit, people on the ground were frozen in short order. Watching a scene of a helicopter pilot freezing in seconds made me think of Yondu in the Guardians of the Galaxy. The cataclysmic premise of the day after tomorrow is fiction. For instance, it's important to know that the rate of temperature change as we go aloft or descend in a column of air depends on the moisture content in the mass of air. Rising or plummeting moist air changes uh, air temperatures at a slightly lower rate than dry air. Dry air, like the uh, descending frigid air in the day after tomorrow, would actually warm up at closer to 5 degrees per thousand feet. The movie shows sinking air getting colder, which is just the opposite of what happens in nature. We can see how this works in everyday life. 
Suppose that we're flying in an airliner at about 35,000 feet. Let's assume that the air temperature outside at 35,000 feet is negative 60 degrees Fahrenheit or 51 degrees Celsius below zero. That's not unusual, by the way. Meanwhile, people on the ground directly below us would be enjoying room temperature conditions. I almost fell on the floor laughing when Dennis Quaid's character, a paleoclimatologist, gave a speech at a conference on global warming in Bombay, India, where they were experiencing a snowstorm. While he was explaining the paradoxical situation in which these world leaders found themselves, he accurately mentioned that warm water currents start at the equator and move poleward. Then, I'm afraid, science is left on the editing floor if it was ever in the script. Quaid focused the audience's attention on a monitor in which the world's uh, normal ocean currents are shown flowing in a completely opposite direction to reality. But that was only half the fun. Ocean currents are shown flowing from the Pacific around Africa and across the equator into the Northern Hemisphere, where they travel in a counterclockwise rotation back to the Pacific, where the whole convoluted system started all over again. Quaid explained to his earnest listeners that the ocean currents gives the Northern Hemisphere its temperate or moderate climate. You're probably asking, isn't that true? Well, first of all, ocean currents are set in motion by wind, with their direction heavily influenced by Coriolis. The Coriolis effect causes fluid moving bodies like ocean currents and air to be deflected to the right in the Northern Hemisphere, that's clockwise, and then to the left, or counterclockwise, in the Southern Hemisphere. Here's where it gets a little complicated. We all know that the Earth is a sphere and it rotates once every 24 hours. The distance around the Earth varies from about 25,000 miles at the equator to only a couple of steps at the North and South Poles. But every point on the Earth, no matter what the latitude is, takes 24 hours to rotate once. A little math tells us that the speed of the Earth's surface at the equator is traveling at 1,040 miles per hour in a counterclockwise motion or rotation. The speed of the Earth's rotation slows precipitously as we approach the poles. This accounts for why ocean currents constantly bend as they circulate around their respective hemispheres. In the movie, Quaid tells the audience that the melting glaciers and ice caps is putting too much fresh water into the ocean, which is messing up the salinity. This, he claims, will stop the conveyor belt of water from bringing warm water into the northern hemisphere or northern latitudes. As a result, the day after tomorrow will usher in another ice age. That's how the movie takes us from global warming to an ice age in a matter of just a few days. Let's dissect this notion for just a minute. When air rises or sinks, it too moves in a circular motion, just like ocean currents. For ocean currents to stop flowing in a clockwise fashion in the northern hemisphere, Coriolis would have to stop operating. Not really realizing the problem with this notion, the movie inexplicably shows three concurrent hurricanes in the northern hemisphere, all of them rotating in a counterclockwise fashion. This brings me to the last issue that I found laughably entertaining. The film shows Tornadoes demolishing Hollywood landmarks and hurricanes forming over Siberia, Scotland, and New York. Why are they unrealistic? Well, tornadoes need aggressive cold air colliding with warm moist air as well as an upper level wind shear like a jet stream. While cold dry air could move down into Southern California, warm moist air is not likely to form and infiltrate the air above Los Angeles because the land of the south of California is an arid desert. And the California current that flows off the coast of California is a cold water phenomenon. Cold water currents produce little evaporation to make air humid. Hurricanes are created by stable upper level air and hot water producing lots of evaporation. <laughs> I'm still wondering where and how land masses in the upper middle latitudes could produce enough hot moist air to form hurricanes, especially when most of Siberia is a cold, cold desert. So true of Hollywood, it had to make a couple of political points before rolling the credits. 
First, we need to stop producing greenhouse gases because we're creating a situation that will lead to another ice age. Second, America should not control the southern border because when the ice age returns, we're going to need the help of our Latin American neighbors. Well, I hope you enjoyed this look at the uh, day after tomorrow and it gave you some food for thought. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you next time here on The Vantage Point.